One of the highlights of this year's Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is a film called As Prescribed. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of As Prescribed, Holly Hardman. Holly, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for having me, having now, an interest in the film. <laughs> absolutely. Now, I was quite fascinated by this. I've seen some documentaries about the opioid uh, crisis um, and how that uh, has uh, created lots of issues uh, around the world. But I had no idea until I saw your film about the benzodiazepine uh, issues and, and uh, situation and the impact that that can have on so many people. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the origins of this documentary. How did it all come about? Well, I'm a survivor. And um, honestly, years ago, if you had said to me, your medical issues, your problems are due to this medication you're prescribed, I would have said, you're, you're crazy. Clonopin is safe. My doctor told me that. Um, I know lots of other people who take it just to take the edge off and um, help us sleep. And we're all fine. My problems are probably still from the years that I was dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome and then, or MECFS, and then a doctor was trying to convince me that my problems were due to metals toxicity. So it took years and I understand the resistance. There is a resistance because it is so difficult to understand that these medications, you know, clonopin, um, Ativan, Xanax, that they are causing the severe issues that they do. It's just, it almost defies belief until you dig into it. Right. Oh, and then I will continue my story. Yes, so I did finally realize that my issue was the benzodiazepine, um, not in the most delightful way. I decided at one point, I, I couldn't understand why I was still being prescribed clonazepam. So I said, well, I'm just gonna stop. I don't like the idea of taking something routinely you know yes it helped with sleep um but four days after stopping i took no i wasn't taking it every day sometimes it would be once every two weeks you know um, even three weeks but this time when i stopped four days later i was in such a state i thought i've got to somehow get myself to the emergency room i don't know what's happening i just everything was just um I was coming apart. So, I, but I managed to get my fingers um, to type stopping clonopin. And as soon as I did that, I found a Wikipedia page that had a lot of information about how dangerous this medication is. And in that, so that was the moment I said, oh, no, I should never have been given this medication long term. I realized that right away. Short term, I want to say short term. Benzodiazepines are very, very helpful. So I want to make that clear. Um, I'm not anti-benzo. I just want to make sure they're prescribed correctly and that people who have been prescribed are helped out of the nightmare of bind benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. So I, I ran into my bathroom, opened the medicine chest, pulled out the little bottle and swallowed one of the clonopin pills. And it was interesting. Within, I'd say, 10 minutes, Oh, stabilized. And I said, yeah, this is this is it. This is it. And from there, I started Googling. And I know they say don't go to Dr. Google, but Dr. Google kind of saved my life because I was I immediately or within the within the first hour or two, I found Geraldine Burns, who, you know, as you know, watching the film, she is the film is built around Geraldine Burns. It is. And and this was, uh, you filmed this over a number of years, and it's uh, quite interesting to follow her journey, but also the journey of a number of other people and their uh, issues and situations and, and difficulties um, with uh, uh, benzodiazepines. So tell me about the filming process, because that uh, I found so interesting. <laughs> well, um, I, I am a filmmaker. I was a filmmaker. So I already had a team of people who could help. I actually had realized that I was having this um, damage issue from clonazepam just around the time my last film was invited to go to IDFA. 
And I thought, oh, you know, that was like in May. So in June, we had a pretty good idea it was going to be it for another biggie. And our first choice was it fun. We got it. Um, so I thought, okay, this is June. It was in November. Yeah, I'm going to just taper off this and I'm going to be fine. I'll be ready for the film festival for the premiere of the film was good people go to hell, safe people go to heaven. And um, it didn't quite go that way. Um, I was still incredibly ill. I, I had been taking um, clonazepam for over 15 years. And um, I, though I was doing a safe taper, I was still trying to figure it out because there's not a lot of information out there about, there, there's more now, but then there was, it was difficult to find um, exactly how to do this. So uh, I did make it to IDFA. And um, at that point I said, somehow I'm gonna get through this. And when I make it to the other side, I am going to make a film about it benzodiazepine issues because I said people my world of people in the film industry the documentary film industry they don't get this and they tend to be very defensive because they can be so helpful and it can take a long time to realize um, the harm so but I quietly said no matter what no matter what pushback I get I'm doing this I'm doing this and so it took me 22 months to taper safely and still keep my life and take care of my daughter I had a little you know, she was about 10 year, 10, 11 years old at the time. And um, I managed, I had contacted Geraldine Burns and I said, you know, when, when I can do this, when I feel ready, would you agree to be filmed? And that was about in May. By August of 2014, um, I was ready to go and she was ready to go. And you see that first day of filming in the film, the very first shot actually is from the first day we filmed. And that was just, um, that wasn't planned. It's just how it worked out in the editing process. Um, and I, so I had this team of people, a lot of who had worked on my last film. It was basically finding, asking the same team of people, team of people to come on board. And then of course we, because it took so many years, we were finding other people. One person would say, I can't shoot, you know, in next month. So how about talking to this cinematographer and so it was just sort of this group of people and there was also somebody in um boston a fellow who sort of keeps on top of crew people in, um and so he helped too That's Tim ben and um as far as editing goes same editor as uh, my last film so that made it a lot easier i had a supportive group of people around me who didn't judge me when I said, I'm going through something and this is a big deal. And maybe you'd be willing to learn about this by working on the film. And it did, it was the case. What a process. And and uh, as I said, shooting this over a number of years, it, it's, it's so fascinating and the people involved. And, and what surprised me was the defensiveness of the medical profession uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, legislation to try and, and limit uh, prescriptions or to stop um, people having side effects, all that sort of thing. It's, uh, I, I found that really interesting, the way you put that into your documentary. Thank you. And I find it infuriating and depressing and just so wrong. And um, thank God there are um, medical professionals who are becoming more willing to study this and speak out about it. Um, there's a, an organization called the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. And there are a couple of, well, there's more than a couple, but I'm in touch with a couple of the MDs who are involved in that organization. And one is a psychiatrist and she's been, uh, she, she almost seems as though she's devoting her life now to making change within her own profession. I also did a, um, a film fest, participated in a film festival this week and uh, there's a, uh, there was an addiction specialist MD in New York, Balsa Madhava, who realized, wait a minute, I'm realizing with my my patients that their benzodiazepine issues are not addiction issues, as you see in the film, that this is more about brain damage, unfortunately. And um, so she, her name is Valsa Madhava, and she came out and spoke at this festival. 
And she now is known as the benzo taper doctor. So she she has she has a different section of her practice devoted to benzodiazepine tapering. And she makes the distinction between addiction to substances, abuse, and then the iatrogenic injury from a benzodiazepine, different, very different realm. How fascinating to hear that. And uh, and I gather this is, uh, because your, your film has been in, in a number of film festivals and, uh, uh, and you've uh, uh, had quite a lot of acclaim for your film, that this uh, is uh, uh, stretching across the world, that people are now realising that there needs to be better control uh, of uh, benzodiazepines. And, and uh, you've got an Australian connection here too with uh, mm -hmm. Aurelia Costarella. An incredible person and, and what he has been through and what he gave up, you know, he was um, just on top of the world and, you know, living, you know, this incredibly high pressured, almost ridiculous life of having to come up with uh, collections every season. Um, he's an amazing designer and, and, and just such a, a person full of heart and um, goodwill and purpose. And he did discover too late, not too late because he's now in the in the world of trying to get the word out, but for, for where he was at, his, at that point in his life, it's just tragic that he lost so much because doctors misprescribed medications to him and injured him so terribly. He has, uh, oh, the story, his story is just, but he is helping. He believes in the film too, and the and the mission we share. And um, so I'm very grateful that he's willing to sort of be the face of as prescribed in Australia. That that's uh, great news. I'm also wondering about the role of big pharma uh, because pharmacies, uh, pharmaceutical companies were obviously implicated with uh, the opioid uh, situation. But I'm wondering now how that works with benzodiazepines. Well, you might like this story. You know, the Sackler family responsible for the opioid epidemic, they had a forebear, Arthur Sackler, who happened to be a genius marketer. And he is um, the individual who he had this marketing advertising company hired by um i think it was roche poulenc at the time roche, was it roche poulenc? hoffman roche hoffman La Hoff it's now roche hmm. the original benzodiazepine the company was hoffman la roche uh and they brought arthur sackler in to help market the first benzodiazepine librium and the second Valium, and he did such a beautiful job that um, Valium became the first $100 million selling pharmaceutical. It's, um, what a family. Um, and and he, he, so it, it's not just that he marketed, his marketing involved lies and um, and lying to doctors. And the, the, um, the company itself, I believe actively suppressed information that would have really changed the story about the release of benzodiazepines. Uh, they knew there were adverse effects, serious adverse effects. They were studying them uh, eight week, after eight weeks and then maybe going into eight months. I, mean, I don't have my facts perfect there but it was they had some long-term studies showing that people were people were helped some people were oh gee it's wonderful mm -hmm. um as you see in the film Matt Stamet when he's first taking the events of has me gee you don't feel anxiety no panic attacks but that's not what everybody was experiencing from the get-go um even Librium which is less potent than Valium was showing serious adverse effects. That information was suppressed. And then I think it just become, and then they're paying tons of money to make sure that they're only marketed as good, 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 good. And then you get a culture of prescribing. You get a culture of taking medications. It's difficult to break through that and get the truth out.
It certainly is, and uh, I'm so glad your film has uh, demonstrated uh, that the issue is uh, responsible. I, I'm wondering, uh, at near the end of the film, uh, I see that some, uh, some states are starting to move on this. So I gather your film um, is making some impact. Oh, I don't think that was the film. <laughs> Though we do want the film to make further impact. You know, um, I will say this, as prescribed, because we were filming for such a long period of time, I was in touch with all these people. And some of them were, you know, we had a certain kind of uh, belief in getting the film made and believing in each other's missions, which is a shared mission. Um, but it wasn't the film wasn't done when the when the when the Colorado group was able to um, effectively convince legislators to pass a law in Colorado. Um, that was that was their work. They did that. The, these those advocates did. and that was one of the people. What, well, actually, two of them were the doctors that I was referring to, Dr. Christy Huff and Dr. Alexis Ritfo, who is in Colorado and with the Alliance, and she's sort of their chief medical director. Um, so there are some marvelous people involved in all this. We, we just we need a lot more money. <laughs> just take money to get the word out. And uh, because I think we have the numbers. Oh, the other thing I would say is that um, people are, with our group, and I do consider myself a part of it, it's difficult for people because people are debilitated. It's an invisible, you know, it's 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 a it's disability. I'm pretty healthy. Um, I've come a long way, but I couldn't even read for a period of time. I mean, it took me four tries to read Matt Salmon's book and you know that wasn't ordinary for me and i had to always say when i get through this i couldn't do math i couldn't sign my name to checks the the, the motor skills it, you know it, it the horror story the way the way the affected live is as you see with scotty in particular in the film and i think paula um if you could get inside their heads i think uh, Scotty in particular describes it quite well with these layers of nightmares. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult way to um, bear life, but you always are looking and believing you're going to get through it. Amazing. Uh, really incredible. I learned so much from, from your film. Uh, I, I'm quite intrigued when Paula and Scotty and, and a few others saw your final version of the film, how did they respond? I've only heard from uh, about Paula through Geraldine. I am, oh, I'm I'm so beyond busy. I can't stand it. I have been in touch with um, Scotty's parents recently. Actually, if, um, I'm worried about Scotty, and I don't want to say much. But I, I, you know, I, I had been in touch with them not so long ago, and then the last time I know there's a, there's a psychiatrist. I've been in touch with who who's in Utah who wants to help him now. So we'll see. But I'm I'm very worried. It's I'm worried because I didn't hear back, and I usually do. Yeah. Yeah. And how's Geraldine going? Well, her daughter just had a baby, and she's helping with the, her grandchild, Isabella. And um, Geraldine is also help. There's a new organization that's it's a, see I think these. These efforts are growing. It's called Coheal, and it's a benzo survivor, and, and she's still dealing with Bind, but she has brought um, Geraldine on board to do some counseling, and so Geraldine takes, she doesn't have a lot of time to give, but she's starting to help people who find her through the Coheal platform. Uh -huh. Good stuff is happening, and, and she's based in Israel. Ah, how interesting. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I gather now research is continuing properly uh, into all of this so that uh, uh, proper studies can be affected. I'd say the advocacy needs to grow to make that happen because the money is not there. These drugs need to be studied long term properly. And, and, and we're nobody's just trying to see the rosy picture the way the original studies were like, let's just look at the good stuff and suppress the bad. Um, the money to fund a drug that's, you know, all, you know, that's not 
you know, the, uh, that's off patent or trademark, you know, uh, what what is the term? I can't think of it right now. It's a very common term about um, when pharmaceuticals are not as valuable to uh, the companies any, anymore. Is it off patent? The generic or, or? Well, yeah. when they can, when, when it's mostly generics, when yeah. the branding, it's yeah. such a, I, I almost want to Google it right now. Sometimes, you know, I'm also dealing with Lyme <laughs> disease now. So it's like my recall for Sorry. words sometimes is really challenged. Yeah. But um, yeah, so um, the, there, I did speak recently with a um, researcher at the University of Pittsburgh and she had seen that people were being harmed by benzodiazepines. And so she has raised some money over the past years to look into not the action of the benzodiazepine that would create this, um, you know, this harm, uh, this um, dysfunction. Um, and she is now trying to raise funds to develop something that could help people going through this so it's 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 there it's 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 more than it was but we need a ton more because this is this is everywhere every country around the world has this misprescribing problem and this bind problem it's just because they're prescribed everywhere yes of course of course i know they're everywhere the uh the benzodiazepine so uh how how really interesting to hear that just wanted to ask you about the editing process i, I know you've put some music uh into the film as well uh allison plants music um but uh tell me about that and and editing because of course that's always uh a, a more difficult part of any final uh uh completion of a documentary well the editing was great before the pandemic i it became very labored and slow uh when we had to work remotely that was not a good thing for the film um very difficult very frustrating but working with allison on the music it was we just we just were able to click and do it rem that's something you can do remotely um pretty even whether whether it's pandemic no pandemic post pre whatever um that worked very well because once we had the film tight um and she she was very good at just giving options and she's very creative and uh that was the real joy okay. you know supporting her to come up with just the right music because she's as you can see she's she's quite something Yes, she yes. teaches at Berkeley School of Music in Boston. She's head of a she's head of a department there. I think it could be called the film scoring department, but it might just be um, another. A, 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 might there might be another name for the department? But she's sort of known as being the scoring um, professor. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Again, how interesting. You mentioned a, a previous film that you made. Can you talk briefly about that? Sure. That film, Good People Go to Hell, Save People Go to Heaven, um, it's quietly political. I made the film because I was very concerned about what was happening politically in the United States and um, seeing that hard right Christianity, um, whether you call it born again Christian fundamentalist evangelical, I think the politically evangelical is used most often. And I just saw with um, Bush that, you know, Bush W, that um, he was using religion to manipulate people. To people. And I, I think he might have actually believed, some, he did believe certain things, but he, I think he used these people politically and then started almost grooming them to have these dangerous, in my mind, conservative beliefs that don't really, it's not really what is in the Bible. I mean, even if you, my opinion, even if you see the Bible as a literal statement of God and Jesus, it's not the interpretation that, you know, people who believe in the rapture and see all, like that, that, that it's only the saved people are going to be saved, saved and go to heaven and all this stuff and have their mansion in the sky. I just found that fascinating, also very disturbing. And um, it's I was very worried about what was happening in the United States politically. And, you know, um, what can I say? I, I, I said, please, 
people should have more people should have watched because watched because then we ended up with Trump because he of course Trump was he wouldn't have made it without the evangelical vote. Yes, mm. yes. Gee, interesting topics that you deal with. Are you working on another film at the moment? No, I'm I'm very much dedicated to the mission of as prescribed. I I just don't know um, if I'll ever be able. I just have to see this through and make sure that that the film does have um, a, a, an involvement in making change, something substantial. And we're starting to work with an impact um, company, a brilliant company based in Los Angeles. I think working with them, you'd say Bonnie Abanza and Kathleen Rogers, I think we can get some stuff done. Well, hopefully. So well done on that. And I noticed the film, which of course will be playing in July as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, uh, coincides with World Benzodiazepine Day on July 11th. That is in the film. That is to honour the late Heather Ashton. You see her honoured at the very end of the credits. We actually just did a, um, updated the end credits so that she and the um, other people who are listed as the tragedy of the, of the suicides that that's closer that that's almost part of the epilogue now so people really see it so yes i mean we all it's it's she's gone she was um i don't know if she she quite reached 90 she was 89 or 91 and she died in 2019 I believe it was, and I could be wrong, you know, with the pandemic, I've lost track of dates. Mm. Um, but it, to me, it seems like yesterday that we lost her. And I'm, I'm, I would say I'm still in touch with meaning when I say I'm still in touch with somebody, it's like, that could mean like six months to a year ago. It's like, I'm so busy. But her, her son still carries the torch as to um, so many people who j just love her for what she gave us with the Ashton Manual and with her research, which by the way, her research, when she wanted to take it to um, a wider, take it wider and and be more thorough, um, the funding, no funding, no funding for the benzodiazepine studies. Mm. And if you look at her CV, why would she not have been funded? Yeah, an incredible, incredible story. And you raise so many issues in your film. Look, Holly, congratulations. As Prescribed is screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July. And we've been speaking to the director of As Prescribed, Holly Hardman. Holly, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure. All the best. Bye-bye.